you, and thank you for braving the cold uh, this morning. My car battery would not start, actually, but I, I, I think I started, but we'll find out. If you've been living in a cave for the last four years without Wi-Fi, you may be surprised to learn that political disputes in the United States have become increasingly acrimonious and divisive. One commentator has just proposed that we should be honest and admit that we are in the throes of a cold civil war, every bit as rancorous as the 1861 to 65 unpleasantness. I used to live in Virginia. That was called the unpleasantness. Some journalists have attributed this divide to a resurgence of political tribalism, a blind devotion to the Republican or Democratic parties. This partisan division, they claim, has been growing ever since the standoff between Bill Clinton and Newt Gingrich. But a recent study by Yale University challenges this analysis. Pollsters discovered that an even deeper source of the divide is the stark differences among strongly held beliefs concerning a range of hot-button policy issues. According to their conclusion, an individual does not vote for a Republican candidate because they ascribe to the motto, the Republican Party, right or wrong, but because they believe fervently in certain stances the Republican Party has taken. And the same holds true of those who vote Democratic. Now among those issues that are uppermost in voters' minds are gun regulation, think of the rally in Richmond yesterday, reproductive rights, LGBTQ rights, and immigration. And that's what we're going to focus on today. Americans harbor deep, intense, and abiding convictions about these matters. And often, the research shows, the most powerful factor that fuels those convictions is religious beliefs and values. So I want to focus on the theological roots of the dispute in the United States about immigration. Today, 68.5 million people are migrating across national borders. That's one out of every 33 persons, a number greater than the entire population of Brazil. The global movements of peoples is so intense that many scholars refer to our era as the new age of migration, comparable to the movements of the Germanic tribes and steppe people in the third to fifth centuries. Now, much has been written about the social, political, economic, and cultural dimensions of the pro-immigration, and I'll call it anti-immigration, positions. But surprisingly, very little has been written about the theological roots of the controversy. This is odd, for in Christian theology, the theme of migration saturates our scriptures. Think of God's call to Abraham to leave Ur of the Chaldeans. Think of the Hebrew exodus from Egypt. Think of Israel's wandering in the desert. Think of the trauma of Israel's exile and return. And migration permeates the New Testament as well from the Holy Family's flight into Egypt to the missionary journeys of Paul. Our sacred stories revolve around themes of demographic movement, dislocation, immigration, and boundaries. These motifs get absorbed by biblically literate Christians almost subliminally. But here's the thing, they have gotten absorbed in two diametrically opposed ways. Our current vitriolic debates feature opposed theological claims about the relation of national security and human insecurity, about national sovereignty and natural law, and about citizenship and discipleship. So if we want to understand the passions that the issue of immigration can ignite we must take a careful look at the theological values inspiring them. 
Now, I'm not going to consider factors like how many immigrants can our infrastructures or our natural resources or our economy absorb without too much disruption. Rather, I'm going to look at the religious values articulated in the pop media, mostly, to support various attitudes towards immigration. I've done a lot of exploration in websites that I normally would never ever look at. And then I'm going to take a stab at excavating the deep, often unspoken convictions that lie behind them. So let's begin with the theological dimensions of what, for want of a better word, I'm going to call the anti-immigration position. Now, in conservative books, blogs, and websites, three arguments emerge. The first, conservative Christian websites often claim that the immigration of foreigners into the land of Israel was regarded as a curse or a punishment upon disobedient Israel. For example, they point out that according to Deuteronomy 28, the rising status of immigrants to a superior social position was a punishment upon Israel. The text warns ominously, the foreign resident among you will rise higher and higher above you and you will sink lower and lower. The foreigner will lend to you, but you won't be able to lend to him. He will be the head and you will be the tail. The anti-immigrationists conclude that these cautionary notes only make sense if there is a background assumption that the well-being of one's own people should be our paramount concern and that the intrusion of foreigners is a threat to that. Many Christian anti-immigrationists do admit that the Bible is also concerned about the well-being of strangers in the land. As Christians, they do recognize that we should be concerned for the well-being of others, regardless of their citizenship. Immigrants, they say, legal or otherwise, should not be treated unfairly or cruelly. But, and here's the but, but because illegal aliens are not really citizens, they should not enjoy the protection of regulations pertaining to such things as wages, labor, and housing. And because they pay little or no taxes, they should not receive the benefits of social services, health care, and education paid for by lawful tax players. They conclude that Christian compassion that would turn a blind eye to illegal immigration is misplaced for it confuses the roles that God gave the church and the state. God ordained the civil government and commissioned it to above all else protect the security and prosperity of its own citizens. Now behind this rhetoric, I think, is a simple but usually tacit conviction. It's this, people, including Christians, have an obligation to take care of those with whom they have special bonds, what ethicists call preferential relations. That means that we have a unique and permanent duty to take care of people in our own families, towns, and nations. The motto for this attitude is charity begins at home and love the neighbor near at hand rather than the neighbor far away. At most, immigrants should be admitted into the United States only insofar as they do not take jobs, money, or opportunities away from native-born U.S. citizens or in any way inconvenience them. I gave a talk much like this in a uh, local church that shall remain nameless. Um, and its denomination will also remain nameless, but its initials are UCC. Uh, and uh, after it was over, um, a lay leader in this particular congregation came up to me and said, if I understand what you're saying, you're actually proposing that I should care about people who are not Americans. 
And I said, yeah, maybe. And uh, what struck me was that just did not compute. It was a thought that had never occurred to him before. For the anti-immigrationists, there is another powerful foundational principle. It's this, God likes cultural and ethnic boundaries. The adherents of this camp often appeal to Deuteronomy 32, 8, which states, when the Most High gave the nations their inheritance, when he separated the sons of man, he set the boundaries of all the peoples according to the numbers of the sons of Israel. Similarly, Proverbs 22 and 23 speak of the establishment of God-sanctioned borders. In Numbers 34, God clearly defined the physical borders for the nation of Israel in detailed geographic terms. The anti-immigrationists conclude that God's ideal for communal religious life included respect for national borders. The reason for this concern with borders, they claim, is that Israel needed to protect its unique religious identity from contamination from Ammonites and Jebusites and Babylonians and Egyptians and all the other ites. So also do those who see the United States as the new Israel, God's new chosen people, resist the contamination of Protestantism by religious others. Israel, they say, then and today would not exist without borders and neither will America, the new Israel. Now this attitude is not novel. The Puritans saw themselves as the last bulwark of Protestant Christianity against the Catholic hordes of France and Spain and ferociously fought to preserve the boundaries of the New England colonies. In the 1840s, the nativist movement, the Know Nothings, terrorized the first wave of Irish immigrants who were condemned as vile, potato-eating minions of the Pope and who would take jobs away from God-fearing Protestants. I'm, God, I'm glad that never happens anymore. More recently, some conservative Christians have, have condemned the Cinco de Mayo celebrations of Mexican immigrants, claiming that the display of Mexican flags proves that they have no intention to assimilate into our culture and way of life, but hope to displace it with their own. Again, the cry is raised that Latinx lack of decency and propriety of conduct, that was a quote, typical of Catholics, shows that they neither desire nor deserve to be participants in Protestant America. One website concludes, when a person from any country enters our country illegally, makes no application for citizenship, does not learn our language, does not care for our customs, that's a crucial phrase, does not care for our customs, and seeks only the benefits of living in America, they have not immigrated here at all. They are not immigrants, but rather illegal aliens and should be treated as such. Behind this view lies an often unacknowledged presupposition. Religion, culture, ethnicity, and nationality should all go hand in hand, reinforcing one another. Although these folks usually do not articulate it, the implied assumption is that the viability of a religion is dependent upon its enmeshment with an ethnic culture and ideally with a geopolitical region with borders. What would Irish Catholicism be without Guinness, Riverdance, St. Patrick's Day, or the Easter Rising? And not the rising of Jesus, but the rising of the Irish Nationalist in 1917. Just as an aside, I'm descended from Irish Nationalists partly, and I went uh, a couple summers ago to the post office in Dublin, which was their last holdout against uh, bombardment by British artillery. And I was hoping to go in and see a celebration of one of my ancestors who was, I knew was in that rising. 
There were two plaques. One was a list of the heroes who had stayed in the post office and died. Another was a list of the cowards who had snuck out the back door. Yeah, you see what's coming. My ancestor was on the list of shame. <laughs> but anyway, Catholicism being Irish all blended together there. And what would Presbyterians be without bagpipes, tartans, and single malts? In this view, cultural boundaries and distinctives are crucial for the preservation of religious identity. And cultural boundaries are best maintained with geopolitical order, uh, borders in this view. A third theological justification for the anti-immigrationist stance is an appeal to the inviolability of civil law. The anti-immigrationists rail that it is against the law to sneak into this country under the cover of darkness without going through the proper procedures. We have laws how to become a US citizen set by the federal government and those laws must be enforced. One website declares, protect our gates, protect our cities, protect our families, obey the law, and if any who enter the gates illegally, let them be expelled. To justify the theme of the inviolability of immigration laws, this faction appeals to John 10.1, where Jesus says, and they use the King James Version usually, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same is a thief and a robber. And so are the illegal aliens in this view. Moreover, they point out that Jesus himself affirmed the importance of civil law and Christianity, when in Matthew 21, he said, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's. And similarly, Romans 13 establishes the authority for civil government and defines its crucial role. So the anti-immigrationists conclude that one has to consider the fact of massive illegal immigration in the light of the biblical teaching of the rule of ro law and the role of civil governments in God's provident, uh, providential design. They admit that the US traditionally has permitted a level of legal immigration, and that's fine. However, according to this view, the illegal nature of much immigration should be resisted by Christians. This faction concludes that Christians who propose amnesty are actually rewarding and encouraging unlawful behavior by those who get here by simply crossing a river, a desert, or a dusty road just to seek a job and are therefore subverting God's purposes. One conservative Christian website proclaims, we have a duty to apply all laws equally and fairly without regard to race, creed, color, or national origin. Our immigration laws must be strictly and justly enforced. The choice is not between our Christian duty and our border laws, it's a matter of life or death for our faith. It's not only a matter of national survival, it's our Christian duty to protect our borders. Behind this stance lies a conviction that obedience to natural law trumps obedience to the claims of compassion and the tug of empathy. This valorization of civil law is in turn fueled by a deep-seated fear of chaos, of disruption that turns the world topsy-turvy. Again, this identification of foreign elements with chaos isn't new. In the 16th and 17th century, the Dutch Protestants likened the Catholic Spanish occupiers to the destructive waters of the North Sea, a primal symbol of chaos that would sometimes break over their dikes and return the orderly canals and streets to disaster. And the Irish entering America in the 19th century were described as tumors that would proliferate without rhyme or reason 
and wreak havoc upon the regular functioning of the social body. More recently, Donald Trump has characterized immigrants from Latin America as rapists and murderers, the ultimate symbols of chaos. So now let's shift gears. The theological defense of what I'll call a pro-immigration stance is equally fervent, and the Christian convictions that support it run just as deep. One central basis for the pro-immigration position is the frequent exhortations in the Hebrew scriptures to not only tolerate and protect, but also to care for the stranger in the land. Leviticus 19 asserts that one should love the stranger as yourself and should not mistreat the foreigner. Leviticus 24:22 states that the same law shall apply for the stranger as for one of your own country. Deuteronomy 27, 19 warns that cursed be anyone who deprives the alien, the orphan, and the widow of justice. Maybe an even more foundational support for the pro-immigration stance is the doctrine of the inherent dignity and worth of every human being based on the common possession of the image of God reflection of the divine attributes in every human person. This is particularly strong in a lot of the Roman Catholic sites. Because of humanity's shared possession of the image of God, the conclusion is that Christians should view immigrants not as a political problem to be solved, but as siblings to be healed, protected, and empowered. So the pro-immigrationists conclude that the policies of exclusion, deportation, internment, and the separation of families are forms of dehumanization that violate the image of God in human beings. Often they cite stories like these. A member of one group of Asian refugees living in the desolate mountains of Morocco, trying to get into Europe, hiding out in cardboard shacks located above an animal shelter with hundreds of dogs barking all through the night, one of these folks remarked, even many of the animals here live better than we do. Another refugee added, it's as if we are worth nothing to the people who live here. And if we die, it won't matter. It will matter less than the death of one of these dogs. A group of Central Americans trying to cross the Arizona desert at night were suddenly surrounded by Border Patrol helicopters. One woman, and this is often reported in the pro-immigrationist websites, one, one woman said, they circled around us and then rounded us up as if we were cattle. It was an awful night, said another, but the worst part was that they started playing the song La Cucaracha, the cockroach over the helicopter intercom. He said, I never felt so humiliated in my life, like I was the lowest form of life on earth, that I wasn't even a human being. Now in those statements that are often repeated, notice the frequency of beast language, dogs, cattle, cockroaches, testimony to the devastating experience of dehumanization. Pro-immigration Christians point out that their refugees neglect by the world make them feel that the most difficult part of being an immigrant is to be no one to anyone. According to these theologians, the doctrine of the image of God condemns any society that treats any group of people as expendable, as detrimental to the national economy, or to the full employment of their native-born citizens. The immigration proponents conclude that the spiritual and moral health of a nation is gauged by how well the most vulnerable, and that means immigrants, are treated, and how well the image of God in them is respected. Now, a second theological motif that supports the pro-immigration stance is an appeal to the central doctrine of the incarnation of God in Jesus Christ. According to this argument, 
And I like this one. I think this one's really interesting. God in Jesus crosses the biggest border of all, the border that separated divine life and human life. In the incarnation, God migrated into human territory, or as Karl Barth said, journeys into the far country. In a shocking and profound way, God becomes a refugee. These theologians point out that God in Jesus not only assumed human flesh in general, but assumed the particular fresh for flesh of a dislocated, persecuted Jew. Jesus literally flees from political persecution when his family escapes into Egypt. And after that, he becomes a migrant, observing that the birds have nests and the fox have holes, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. According to Luke, Jesus had no home in which to be born and no tomb in which to be buried. And when he borrowed a tomb, even then, he didn't stay in it. From the tomb to the womb, no, from the womb to the tomb, Jesus was an itinerant. Jesus' whole life, the way of the cross, integrally involved solidarity with those who experience economic injustice, family separation, political oppression, and even premature and painful death. These Christians claim that Jesus walking the walk of the refugee, experiencing the same agonies that they experience, can give migrants a sense that God is crossing the desert and the sea with them, supporting them, encouraging them, and giving them hope in the most hopeless of circumstances. Yet another theme in the pro-immigration theological apologetic is the unrestricted universal scope of the command to love the neighbor. The neighbor in the parable of the Good Samaritan is anyone in need, regardless of nationality or ethnicity. In imitation of Jesus, Christians should strive to actualize the practice of hospitality and inclusive table fellowship. From this perspective, the significance of Jesus' table fellowship with sinners and social outcasts is that he transgressed the human borders that separate one human being from another. The story of Jesus in this view is the enactment in time of space of God's eternal, universal, unqualified, and unrestricted love for all people. As one theologian insists, if the incarnation is about God crossing over the divine human divide, the mission of the church is to cross the human human divide. It is fundamentally a message of reconciliation, a realization that the borders that define countries may have some proximate value, but they do not ultimately define the body of Christ. The life of Jesus unites people beyond the geopolitical boundaries that divide us and promises a new world of global solidarity and even a love that recognizes no borders. The church's own existence as a pilgrim people, wayfaring from the city of humanity to the city of God, highlights the centrality of migration in our heritage in this view. The extravagant evangelization narrated in the book of Acts transcends geopolitical borders, ethnic identities, and cultural identities. As Paul said, in Christ there is neither Jew nor Greek. So these theologians maintain that from this perspective, the real aliens are not those who lack appropriate legal documentation, but those who are so alienated from their own empathy for their suffering neighbors that they fail to see in the eyes of the stranger a mirror of Christ. Christian discipleship, in this view, reminds us that the most daunting borders to cross are those that are inscribed in the hearts of each of us. So, we seem to be at an impasse. Along with global warming, immigration is possibly the most urgent and seemingly intractable issue of the 20th century. As we have seen, the core issues surrounding immigration lay right at the heart of the Christian faith. 
Let's remember that theological convictions are not just propositions to be entertained by the mind. Rather, they are invitations to imagine a vision of what it means to live in the presence of God and love our fellow human beings. But Christianity is a funny thing. Its most fundamental principles can be construed differently, and here they have been. Both of the positions about immigration that we have examined appeal to the Bible. Both make claims based on the basis of Christian traditions and both aspire to be ethical. The people in both camps are not necessarily either stupid or evil. But in the light of these divergent interpretations, what are we supposed to do? Who is right? You know, I do have a proposal, because I know what's right. <laughs> How we interpret our faith in regard to these matters says more about who we are spiritually than it does about the Bible and the history of Christian doctrine objectively considered. As we look to the Bible and tradition for guidance, the ultimate question is, what kind of people do we want to become? Do we want to be people who take care of their own kind first and foremost? Or do we want to be people who risk their own well-being to love not only their neighbors near at hand, but also strangers and neighbors far away? Which do you want to be? And do we want to be people who seek the comfort of a symbiosis of faith and culture, of church and flag? Or do we want to be people who recklessly follow Jesus' transcendence of all boundaries? Which do you want to be? Do we devote our lives to staving off chaos with the tools of civil law? Or do we following the promptings of the spirit of universal empathy? Which do we want? In the final analysis, how we interpret the Bible and how we respond to the global immigration crisis is a matter of our hearts and what we want to be in them. Thank you. And so now, now I'll be willing to uh, take questions, observations, ridicule. We have two microphones here. Crystal Evans is circulating with one in the back. So just raise your hand and I'll pass you a microphone. I see a hand here. Oh no, I'm sorry. <laughs> Don't be shy. No questions? Well, I want to know, uh, Professor Barrett, have you gotten any advertisements on your social media in response to uh, your exploration of websites that you don't normally uh, look at? Uh, no, I don't go on. I, I don't have a social media presence. I, I just uh, Just wondering, because yeah. that's, that's the I'm danger a, for yeah. a lot of us yeah, about... I'm, I'm, just, I'm just a voyeur. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I have been afraid that the school might uh, monitor my online presence and ask why I'm looking at neo-Nazi websites. I, I, the way you ended, uh, I just wish you could say a little more about that, about the uh, matters of the heart being the key thing for uh, our faith response. And, uh, so could you just enlarge on that a little bit more? Yeah. Um, well, uh, Augustine uh, said on a few different occasions that the most appropriate interpretation of a scriptural passage was the passage, was the interpretation that upbuilt the community in love. So a, 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 a true interpretation is the loving interpretation. And uh, I agree with that. Uh, the scripture often reminds me of uh, uh, Jastrow and Wittgenstein used a two duck rabbit. It can look like a duck from one perspective, shift your gaze, and it looks like a rabbit. Now, is it a duck or a rabbit? Well, in a way, it's both. 
So in scripture, my, my, my point was, those passages about protecting ethnic religious culture and protecting geopolitical borders and uh, valorizing civil law, they're really there. And they're not isolated and they're not a minor motif in scripture. They really are there. But so also are the themes of transgressing borders, of embracing a love that knows no ethnic boundaries. So which, which, can you tell which one is objectively more important? I don't think so. So it's, it's not primarily a battle about who's got the right biblical interpretation. It's what do you want to use the Bible for? Do you want to use the Bible for reinforcing a sense of national and cultural identity and solidarity? Or do you want to use the Bible to expand the vision of who our neighbor is? And that's a personal decision, it's a spiritual decision. So that, that's why I was suggesting it's, it's ultimately a matter of a person's heart and what they want their heart to be like. Did, did that make sense? Yes, thank you. Uh, Lee, um, as you know, every Sunday in London on the corner of Hyde Park is Speaker's Corner, and uh, where people get up and say outrageous things, and they are entitled to do so. We now have a million Speaker's Corners. Yeah. They're called websites, and they're called blogs, and all of that. I'm a little concerned that um, in making your points, you rightfully turn to websites with, I'll uh, call them, uh, outlying on the edge of arguments, you know, strong feelings. That website may be the product of two or three people. I'm curious in your research as you search through these, did you go to sources online which appeared to have a very balanced view of, yes, I'm in favor of this, but Yes, I oppose this, but yeah. and providing some balanced wisdom in what is by anything a difficult choice politically, economically through all of us. Did you find a point of view that you admired and said, not, not necessarily because they're speaking from their heart, but just that they seem to take into account all the cross currents of the debate and the choices through of all kinds of immigration uh, and what did you see from them that you had admired? Well, well thank you, that's a, that's a good question. And about my procedure, what I did do was look at some of the um, more pop websites, particularly, particularly ones that got a lot of hits, and also some of the extreme ones on both sides. But also uh, some of the more academic th uh, theological texts uh, that back them up. So the, the attitudes I was describing were found both in the pop stuff, but also in the more scholarly stuff on, on both sides. Was there anything in the middle in either case? In regard to the pop stuff, almost none that I could find. Maybe I just haven't looked far enough. But in some of the, the, the more academic uh, uh, writings, uh, there was a middle of the road position which was, yes, we should love aliens, we should love refugees, we should love our neighbors far, not just our, our neighbors near at hand, but, and there was always a but, but not to the extent that would it jeopardize our ability to love our neighbors near at hand, which translated into, we should admit immigrants, maybe even give amnesty to folk who have entered without documentation, but, we have to keep in mind how many people the United States can support without ruining its economy and its infrastructure and maybe even running out of water. So, there, so that was a middle of the road position um, that it, which was present in some of the academic stuff, particularly among ethicists influenced by Reinhold Niebuhr. Um, but it was almost non-existent in the pop stuff. Does, did other people just hear heavenly music? <laughs> yeah. I was expecting to hear a little bit about the Book of Ruth. Seems to me that that's a good uh, oh, yeah. Yeah. image of immigration and 
think he also, uh, this year, uh, my family's been in Lancaster County 300 years. There were Mennonites who left the Canton of Bern, went to Holland, and then went to England, and they came over. And if it would have been for that type of, uh, what would you say, uh, acceptance of that that's the way it is, uh, my family probably wouldn't have made it out of uh, Bern. They probably wouldn't have been Bern. out of Bern during the <laughs> yeah. 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 So. Yeah. Yeah, the, the, book of, the Book of Ruth is, is appealed to, um, but sometimes gingerly, because I, I, I think these days a lot of folks see a problem with it in that it seems to be sexist. Um, you know, that Ruth sort of is accepted through seductive practices and that paints women in a, in a, in a not very flattering light, at least according to some sensibilities. Um, so Ruth wasn't as prominent as I thought it would be, which, was, which surprised me a little. But you're right, because there, there, there is another instance of migration and um, hospitality across borders. I was thinking more of the, uh, the saving and Naomi yeah. family from family. Yeah. Yeah. And then the love that right. Ruth and Naomi, who right. were initially strangers, right. a multiplied and uh, a Jewish woman become, uh, you know, just almost one family. Right, right. Now that is, a, I think that is a powerful story of cultural border crossing. About uh, immigration as a matter of heart. I also remember Dr. O'Brien saying that we can't proclaim or interpret scripture without a, a thorough understanding of the context. And the, the scripture that I'm hearing as evidence for anti-immigration stances, um, I, I find problematic in terms of the, the context from which it comes versus how it's being applied today. Could you speak to that a bit? Yeah, I, I think there's some truth in that. Um, I'm debating whether to say what I really think. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, well, first, let me preface it. You, you may have noticed that when I was talking about the, the anti-immigrationist stance, it was ba mostly based on specific passages, but also a broader theme of, of preserving the unique identity of the people of Israel through preservation of borders, cultural, geopolitical, and otherwise. But there are a lot of specific passages. The um, defense of the, I'll call it the pro-immigration position, appeals more to broad themes than it does to specific passages. Mostly, this, the universal sweep of, of uh, God's love for humanity in Christ and the universal sweep of the missionary activity of the early church. Um, so those, those are differences. Do you go with specific passages or broad themes? Um, yes, and it's important to put passages in their original context and extrapolate and, and be wary of inappropriately extrapolating from them themes that apply to our own. So that's that that's absolutely true. However, I'm uh, I remain suspicious of the ability of higher criticism to get at anything like the objective meaning of scripture. It seems to me that um, folk who put scripture in historical context how they construe that context is really a matter, largely, of what's in their own hearts. So it's not just fundamentalists who uh, allow their own agenda to influence scripture, so also do the historical critics. I wanna make it clear, I did not just undercut the Bible department at Lancaster Theological Seminary. <laughs> Historical context can be important. I'm not sure it's decisive. Dr. Barrett, thank you for your excellent talk. I have two questions, one for each side. The first one is, what do you account for this amnesia about the uh, anti-immigration side? Uh, they don't ever talk about the pilgrims coming yeah. here. 
uninvited, to put it uh, politely. Uh, everything that they tell us to fear about the immigrants, they did. They killed, they maimed, they took the land. So nobody talks about it. And what do you account that uh, to? On the pro-immigration side, this demand for immigration, immigration rights, do you suppose it will find some uh, sympathy if it were presented as a prayerful request for mercy and grace instead of demand? Yeah, to the second one, I think you might be onto something. A prayerful request for mercy and grace uh, might go a long way. Um, the first one, the amnesia, that uh, how did uh, uh, everybody who's not a Native American forget that they're immigrants and that many of them entered illegally uh, is peculiar. I, I think it's deliberate. Uh, it's part and parcel of a, the general amnesia of America. We usually can't think back for more than two generations at most. Um, it's, uh, and, and it's, and, it, and it's weird. Um, my non-Irish ancestors were English Baptists who migrated here uh, without uh, proper channels, and they stupidly migrated to Massachusetts Bay, which was a very um, non-Baptist, uh, congregational Calvinist uh, colony where because they were Baptists, they had their ears cut off. Um, then they very stupidly moved to Long Island, which was Dutch Reformed Calvinist, where they had their tongues cut out. And run, running out of appendages, they moved to New Jersey, where nobody cared. And, um, but yeah, that, th those family histories that most of us came here as refugees, uh, you know, the, the, the migration into Pennsylvania by the Anabaptists uh, was, was mentioned earlier. Uh, and even the, the uh, Pennsylvania Dutch Lutherans and Reformed, basically refugees, fleeing from the wars of Louis XIV and then Louis XV, um, from famine, plague, devastation. Yeah. much, uh, Dr. Barrett, and uh, the mic is coming for her shortly. Uh, I, I appreciate your uh, emphasis on it being a matter of the heart and the choice that we have. I also ran into a, a Muslim couple as we were both strolling along a beach recently and uh, got into conversation with them. They immigrated immigrated from several countries in Africa 15 years ago and recently are feeling an uptick in resistance to them. And they approach it with an attitude of forgiveness that when, when somebody uh, says a word against them, they try to understand where they're coming from and they don't let it attach itself to them. They also observed that those who have had exposure experience with people who are unlike them are much quicker to accept who they are, to be curious about their life instead of the initial rejection. So I wonder if we should also add into the influences of both of these uh, views of immigration, the influence of experience and exposure. Yeah, thank you. I, I think you're right. Um, where uh, uh, one study concluded that the most virulent um, anti-Islamic sentiment in the American population was found in North Central Michigan, where there are virtually no Islamic people. So there no exposure, but a great deal of fear uh, due to lack of familiarity, probably. Uh, partly. Um, I th think it goes back to the thing that there, there is in the United States, it seems to me, two very different kinds of people. 
One are the globalists who, are, who have business contacts, educational contacts, personal contacts, friendships with folk from other cultures and other countries. Usually they're in education, high-tech industries, business, banking. And then there's another kind of person, often um, industrial laborer, coal miner, farmer, who doesn't have exposure to such people. And they remember a day when their parents or their grandparents lived in a community where everybody was the same, same ethnicity, same Protestant religion, and were relatively prosperous. And they want those days back. And they conflate those two things, prosperity and homogeneity. And they take out their fear that our way of life is changing and it's changing in a way that economically disadvantages us, they take that out on immigrants. And again, they don't really usually know any. Oh, yes, uh, at the beginning of your, of your talk, you gave some statistics I'd like you to repeat those, if you don't mind, because I'm concerned about the number of homelessness with the immigration problems that we have throughout the world. Yeah, and, and this was um, global, yeah. Global. Go global statistics, would not you, just the United States. Would you States. go over that, please? Yeah, 68.5 million people in transit right now across national borders. Yep. And you said that was per one year. in? Yeah, that's one out of every 33 persons in the, in the world. I can't wrap my head around that. That's a lot of people doing a lot of moving. Um, okay, I'm just an observer, and I'm a Christian, but I feel very helpless as to how I, as a lonely single person, not lonely, but single, I belong to a church, but I don't see the churches, per se, doing enough. I see small groups of people um, that are trying to do things, and I'm feeling very helpless. How can we begin to make a difference? How can we, as just a single person, really make a difference in the homelessness, in the immigration crisis, just in our own uh, town, our own state, our own county? Yeah, good, good question. Well, and in fact, nationally, Lancaster rates high as in regard to, at least it has until recently, hospitality to folk from other countries. In fact, phenomenally high. Uh, often through church sponsorships. So local congregations can do a lot to sponsor families um, and provide services for families. Uh, and it seems to be happening in Lancaster about as much and maybe more than it is anywhere else. Um, so this is not just a public policy problem at the national level or the state level. There's a lot of stuff that can be done locally. Lee, I'll jump in here. I'll um, give this microphone back, if I may. What? Oh, I'll jump in here. I have experience with some organizations here in Lancaster County, Church World Services. Most of you probably know about Church World Services. So if you contact them, they are a great organization to make contact and find out just, you know, ground level kinds of things that you can do as far as um, materials, furniture, su sub, you know, supplies, transportation, help with um, integration into school systems, all of that. So Church World Services is a great organization. The Bridge Program is also a great program. And that gives you the opportunity to really hear these stories that we talked about, this person back here spoke about, with really understanding what these people are, have gone through as far as immigrating into this country. So those two places are, are great resources for you. I think this person here has a question. Hi, Dr. Barrett, I'm one of the pastors at Highland Presbyterian Church, where you've spoken many times. And we have a theologically diverse church, and probably indicative of that diversity is one of our men's groups. And we've talked about immigration, we've had um, some deep discussions, and it seems to me that part of the issue, whether they're 
theologically conservative or liberal is the legality is a common denominator that they talk a lot about. But there is a fear, and I wanted you to speak on that fear. And the fear is more of when an immigrant comes in the country that you mentioned culture, that they are coming in here to live by their culture only. And of course, one example would be the Sharia imposition. And so that seems to be the fear that I see in some people mm -hmm. who are theologically diverse. Would you speak to that? Yeah, right, and I, I think that parallels the remark that was made about the celebration of Cinco de Mayo, that these people have no intention of assimilating. And in fact, they're gonna to try to inject their culture into ours and take ours over. Um, there may be limits to how much accommodation and how much assimilation can occur. Uh, groups, religious groups that violate individual rights are probably not, well, they're certainly not to be tolerated as long as they violate individual rights. But be, beyond that, um, we are a melting pot or a, maybe even a rainbow coalition or a Waldorf salad. Um, and in the past, the same, the same arguments that we can't tolerate this group because they are not assimilatable that is now being said about many Muslims. Um, originally, that was said about Catholics um, and Quakers. Um, Catholics are going to be minions of the Pope. Uh, they're going to subvert our Protestant way of life. Uh, and therefore, and, and they'll form uh, little Catholic enclaves and they'll have their own parochial schools that will teach anti-American values uh, and therefore uh, we cannot have that. So uh, I, I think the, the themes that you heard articulated that uh, maybe certain kinds of uh, Muslims cannot be, um, are going to resist assimilation and are just beyond the pale for America. Um, that, that's really not new. Um, what has happened in the past is it turns out, well, they're not going to be entirely assimilated. Actually, thank God. Uh, that would be a really boring culture. If, you know, just think if everybody were Pennsylvania Dutch throughout the nation. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know you'd, everybody would be eating, you know, chicken and noodles and chicken on waffles and you know, there'd be no Thai food. You know, so um, I, I don't think that's an, an attractive prospect of, of uh, cultural homogeneity. And, uh, but in the past, the groups that had been feared do figure out uh, a way of negotiating the tension between generic American values and the values unique to their subculture. So I don't think that that's... Um, anything to be terribly afraid of, although many people, you're right, many people are. And it is the fear of what's gonna to happen to the way of life we have known and cherished. In, in fact, the, the, um, it's interesting you mentioned that because the study that investigated North Central Michigan discovered that uh, all these basically Dutch reformed people were terribly afraid that Sharia law was going to be imposed upon like, you know, Holland, Michigan. I think, I, yeah, Bonnie. Um, many years ago, Will Herberg wrote a book called Protestant Catholic Jew. And in it, he describes how, and this was related particularly to language and immigrants coming to this country. The first generation coming here does not learn the language. First of all, language is time sensitive. Uh, if you don't learn a language by the age of 12, you have a very difficult time of learning sophisticated language in any language, okay? So the second generation wants to be American and they are in school with other children, they learn English, um, they go to work, they're in the workplace and, and they learn English and so that they can 
be assimilated, quote unquote. And it is the third generation that wants to go back and at least learn the language of, of the original people. So some of this has to be, you have to take time with some of this to understand what is going on. What I find very interesting, um, I pastor a small rural congregation in Jerusalem Lutheran Church in Rothsville, which is between Ephrata and Lidditz. And Sunday morning, invariably, there are horses and buggies going by my church. Now, these folks have been here for a couple centuries and have not assimilated, all right? Uh, and yet we don't have, you know, sort of the same prejudice uh, against this particular group of people that we do for new people coming here. So historically, this is, this is what happens. Um, unfortunately, in the climate we have right now, this is very ugly. Um, one of the, I'm, I'm gonna do a little boasting here. I visited my son who lives in Texas uh, this is the other thing. Our children are not staying home, you know, generation after generation. They're moving away, okay? And he invited me to Thanksgiving meal at his house. There were 13 people there. There were four continents around that table with first-generation immigrants. To me, that's what we need to be looking for. Well, 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 thank you, and, and you reminded me of um, one of the quips from Will Herberg, which was, the third generation tries to remember what the second generation tried to forget. So ev eventually you get a desire to recover the language, the customs, the rituals, uh, and, the, and, and the food um, of, of uh, immigrant communities. And you rightly pointed to the fact that this takes a long time. Um, and what ha I think culturally there has been a shift away from the melting pot of total assimilation to working out a modus vivendi. Uh, in, in a Waldorf salad, the, it doesn't get pureed. The, you know, the, the walnuts stay walnuts, and the, and the cheese stays the cheese. But they, but they all coexist together in a non-hostile manner, which to the palate is actually pleasing. But that takes a while to figure that out. You know, to figure out, in a, in a Waldorf salad, well, you can have the walnuts, and you can have the raisins, you know, but don't put maple syrup on it, <laughs> which I'm afraid would be the Pennsylvania Dutch uh, <laughs> instinct. <laughs> a form of maple syrup on walnuts is called baklava. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, if I may, I'd just like to piggyback on what was just said of this first, second, and third generation in my personal life. That's precisely what happened. My grandfather and grandmother set, uh, settled in central Pennsylvania in the coal region. My pop came down to law school in Carlisle, and that's where my brother and I were born. But we have a fourth generation and a fifth generation now. And I'd like to just add to that right now, because I, I speak to my brother about his, his children, who are that fourth generation. Um, we're Greek. Well, they're American. Um, for a while, we were Greek-American. And they still eat feta cheese. Um, but they think differently now. They don't hold on to those things that, and that's okay. Um, they don't hold on so much to the thinking. They have some of the same internal rhythms that the previous generations have, but they don't think the same. I really think there is a melting pot. Um, right now, I'm writing to my niece and nephew, I'm writing kind of like a memoir, because I want them to remember what it was like. A grandfather, a grandmother who could not read English, a father who graduated from law school, her son, and now the fourth generation who, who really understand themselves as being Americans. So I think it does take time. Um, I'd like to say one more thing, and that is I think our silence as Christian people to say the type of behavior, the type of language, the type of bias that you so freely express is wrong. And that's the Greek in me. Yeah. <laughs> 
You see, you're not totally assimilated. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I, I hope it was, it was clear that one of the things I was uh, trying to suggest is that for the two sides in this dispute uh, to um, have any chance of hearing one another and understanding one another and maybe coming slowly to some kind of accord will take getting at the deep issues rather than the surface issues. And among the surface issues, I, 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 I throw in things like, well, what about medical care? I mean, that's important. But below that is the, uh, the, the issue of why should anybody care about that for a stranger from another country? And until we get to that level, why should we care uh, and why do we care? Uh, I'm afraid people will just continue to talk past each other and continue to use uh, inflammatory rhetoric, which is just not helpful. Well, this might be a place to stop. I can tell we started to spin out our own stories, and it would be interesting to hear more of those in private conversations. Let's thank Professor Barrett for his very enlightening talk. Thank you. Thank you.